God damn it. I want the truth. You can't Cool. We'll just jump into it because I just want to get talking with you. Um, so welcome, everybody, to another episode of Face the Truth. Um, I've known this person for quite a while. <laughs> you, I've known you for a long ass fucking time and you've person. crashed on my floor many times. <laughs> yes. This, hum, this humanoid. Um, <laughs> no, that's true. I have uh, I've crashed at Molly's house so many times. Um, had some really good memories. Um, but she is an amazing artist. She's a writer journalist um gosh an entrepreneur um she's a belly dancer i think <laughs> um <laughs> and she makes some good a uh, hell of a good uh, uh set of uh, eggs after a long night of drinking um and some good coffee as, as well so everyone please welcome molly crabapple Thank you for this applause, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. I'll add in real applause uh, later. So, <laughs> <laughs> how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I got my uh, COVID vaccine two days ago, oh. so I'm finally kind of kind of recovering from that. But I feel like after this like miserable hell year of shit and death, like spring is coming and life is coming back, and everyone's getting vaccinated and like fuck yes, joy again. Yeah. <laughs> and so, did you have any um, like reactions uh from the vaccination or anything like yeah like a, a bit like when a, okay. like when you have a flu shot so um oh, okay yeah yeah nothing 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 too bad i'm still waiting to be able to get i i don't know when that's going to happen here but um how did you get it <laughs> is um, there like a um i mean because isn't it is it still going by by age groups or is it um... it's age groups jobs comorbidities and then sometimes there are just oh, extra okay. Okay, so you're one of those lucky ones. Yeah, I'm one of the one of the lucky ones. Because you're still I, no, such actually, a baby. You're not a. You <laughs> I'm, I'm actually 65. I, it's just yeah. clean living and you know virgin's blood that makes my skin mm. look like this. Lots of virgin's blood. Yeah. yeah, lots of virgin's blood. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah, no, I've been I've been waiting to to get mine as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 been a really 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 strange year. Um, how have you guys been coping with everything there in New York? I mean, I know it's, it's been, it seems like it's been a little bit crazier than, than, than most places. I think New York, I, well, so I was doing research and I think New York had more people die than like any other city in the world, like, except hmm. maybe Wuhan, like depending on the statistics, but like yeah. leaving aside Wuhan, we had the most people die and it was like an apocalypse movie at first. I mean, yeah. you know, the street, the streets were totally empty. You heard nothing but sirens and it was, it was horrible. I mean, um, so many people, so many people died and everything was closed. And, and you know how, like, in, I mean, I guess Chicago is like this too, but you know, in a lot of America, everything is spread out. You don't really know what your neighbors are doing, right? Like just geographically, architecturally, that's how an American city is. Yeah. But like in New York, and I think in Chicago, like you're all on top of each other. And so like when people are dying in one place, you know, you, you, you feel it, like you see it. It's not something that's separated. It's not like you're in some like suburban house, you know, miles yeah. from people. So um, it was, it was horrible, you know, and um, but, you know, I have, you know, I have best boyfriend in the world. So I, uh, me and Fred, you know, we, I learned, I actually, I learned to cook this year. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I know, he, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. You're like he laughing. He told me that. He's like, yeah. she's cooking. Wow. This is great. Yeah. And, and good. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not bad at it. Um, That's awesome. I don't know. I think the biggest thing was just like trying to help out the city and stuff. Cause with New York, it wasn't just, you know, the COVID it was that, um, so much of the city it's dependent on like restaurants and you know service industry stuff and when you when you had the lockdown like it was like so many businesses closed and um so many people were out of work and and so many people in the city are immigrants since they couldn't you know get get um help and so yeah. i mean it was just it was really grim so i tried to you know do lots of stuff with like dropping off food and you know um stuff stuff like that and and i guess also just kind of kind of documenting documenting the city at this time because so 
New York, like the plague of New York, the scourge of my fucking city is this character that I call hedge fund Brett. He's like this douchebag fucking um, hedge funder or finance dude that doesn't really care about anything. He just wants to like get some money and go to the club and have his models and bottles. And, and he has sucked the city drive for so many years. He has made it bland to his stupid out of town tastes. And when uh, COVID happened, um, hedge fund Brett fled so fucking fast the first thing that he did he maybe like a week and he was to his summer home you yeah. know and <laughs> despite all this death and all this poverty and all of the really horrible stuff it was like you could breathe a little bit easier because hedge fund brett wasn't here anymore and it felt like a little bit like you know like my city fred's city you know the city of you know my friends the city of my mom the city of everyone you know who who grew up here and not just like a city for you know bajillionaires yeah, that's what I've been hearing. I've been hearing from different people that New York almost feels like a reset, almost like of the 70s or 80s. And it's a lot more like a lot of things are still shut down, like f permanently. And, you know, is that, is that true? Like a lot of places are totally just gone. And oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, I've been, I've been hearing stuff about places being boarded up right next to a nice place that's just happening. But the place next to it's just totally gone, boarded up, people squatting and stuff like that. I don't know how much of this stuff is true. <laughs> I Chicago's mean, I have not as much. Squatting. I wish there was squatting. If anyone like is involved with any squats in New <laughs> York, gonna... like call me. My email's pretty out there. <laughs> um, no, but what I was going to say is Chicago hasn't really been that bad as far as like, you know, like it, Chicago is way more open, way more spread apart. The worst thing that's ever happened, I think, in Chicago during this time was what during the, the riots downtown. It, it got pretty crazy down there. But, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of I've noticed a lot of businesses that are totally permanently gone. Restaurants that are I mean, I saw a list of just restaurants and places that are just that, that's it. They're done. They're gone. So it, it's definitely a really strange time. Um, I feel lucky just myself that I work from home, you know, so I've been able to kind of keep up with, you know, at least I'm, I've got some work. It's been slow, but it's, at least I'm still have you know, doing some things. Have you been able to keep busy like work wise? Yeah, like, yeah, I have. I've been really, really, really lucky with that. Um, one thing that helped me a lot was I, I do these animations and, um, I think because, you know, it was unsafe during the pandemic to have actors and, you know, shooting and all of that, a lot of people maybe who would have done like live action stuff instead came to me to do the, to do these like animated shorts. And so that was really good. I mean, that, that fucking saved me this year that, um, that I did so many of those, but yeah, with the businesses, I mean, the problem is that in a lot of cities, like rent is really, really expensive. And if you have a lockdown mm -hmm. and people can't make any money, but the landlords are, at least in New York, the landlords didn't give people breaks on rent. They were just like, yo, 10,000, $10,000 a month. I don't care if you're like not allowed to open your doors. And so like a lot of small businesses, the owners, they went through their like life savings, then they went bankrupt, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. So there's no, you have like no grace periods at all. Like, um, like I, I saw you posting stuff about that. Uh, um, protesting and everything, but nothing has come of that at all. Like no relief. So there's um, there's a they can't do evictions for residential places, um, okay. and I th and I think that ends in May. But they didn't like do mm. any bailout of the rent. So what's happening now is like okay, let's say you're you know some like guy who's like um you know like a Mexican dude who's a waiter who wasn't eligible for um you know, for the, the, the original COVID relief or for unemployment. So what happens is you haven't paid your rent for like five months and you can't be evicted, but then like when five months is over and, you know, the eviction moratorium is lifted, like you owe, you know, sometimes like $10,000 and like the landlord is like, where's my money, you know? Yeah. And um, they haven't really made any plan for that. It's been pretty shameful because I think that anyone looking at these like really expensive mm -hmm. cities where so many people are out of work in them, would see like, oh, a lot of people won't be able to pay their rent. And, you know, you can't just have people like racking up, you know, debt forever. You have to, you know, make some sort of solution. You have to like pay their rent for them or, you know, or, or tell their landlord to suck it or something, you know, but you can't, but you can't just have them racking up debt. Um, so, but there's, there's been a, there's a movement in New York to try to try to cancel people's you know, rent debt, uh, which, which I'm involved in, but I just think it has to be done. Cause it's crazy. Like, what are these landlords going to do? They're going to like evict some poor family, um, and then like hunt them for the next five years for like, you know, five or 10,000. It makes, it makes no sense. It's, it's just like compounding misery for everyone. Yeah. 
No, I definitely, it's, it, that's, that, I'm, I was curious about that because it's here, we're, there's a little bit of that going on, but we, we actually got something um, in the mail that basically said we could fill out this form and we're basically protected for a certain amount of time. But I think it, I think it is till May as well. Um, but yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm just curious how, how you guys have been doing with that whole thing, because um, you know, you both, uh, you and Fred both uh, make a living doing your art and writing and everything else. And so uh, you get to work from home during this kind of a thing. But at the same time, it's like, um, you know, it's a little bit scary when everything is basically against you at this moment. You know, creativity, you know, you can't go out. Well, actually, what has it been like for you now in New York? Because as it started to open up, can you go out more now and yeah, go to places? Yeah, it's, and- it's pretty open. And, and also, I mean, people, you know, they do underground stuff too you know um you can't you 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 definitely can't you definitely can go out I mean the people I feel for are like performers and stuff like my friends who are dancers or comedians I mean that's that's fucking Mm -hmm. rough right now um but I think like for for us as artists it's more just that a lot of you know places they feel like art is like the least essential thing right it's the least essential part of the budget of course and so it's really scary like you feel like oh if you know, there's like a financial downturn and they have to cut something like, who are they going to cut? They're going to cut, you know, me. Yeah, no, that's, I've, I've been experiencing that where a lot of basically ever since things started happening last spring, um, certain clients are like, Hey, this is, you know, we no longer have a budget, but we still want you to do the exact same amount of work for us. Um, and there's been a lot of loss as far as like illustration type work, um, and you, you can either take on the job for nothing or let some newbie that's hungry for work take it on. But then, and I've ended up taking on a bunch of those kind of jobs being like, I can't believe I'm doing it for this much right now. Like yeah, this well, is ridiculous. And especially what like other choice like, do I have? <laughs> and you're like the top caricature artist in America, I think, or like one of, one of them, like in my opinion, and like people are still trying that shit with you. Yeah. It's been frustrating. <laughs> well, and, 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 and big, bigger clients too. And, um, you know, with going back and forth with my agent about things like, are you kidding me? I, I, I can't do this kind of work for this kind of money. It's just ridiculous. I have four daughters now to take care of, but, um, it, it you know, it's, it's actually seems like it's getting a little bit better. Um, but it's been really slow. And so it's been a, this has definitely been a super challenging time for sure. Um, and that's one thing, actually, what I wanted to bring up is like, as artists, we have to, we have to, you know, besides this fucking pandemic thing, we usually always have to hustle. We, you know, that's just the, the name of the game. You know, I've been a freelance illustrator for like 20 years and that's all I've had to do. I've been taking care of myself and my family for that long, just drawing pictures, you know, <laughs> um, but you have always had this The one thing I noticed as soon as I met you. Um, you, you, you're obviously a, an, you know, an insanely passionate person, but you, you always have like this hunger and this drive, uh, for figuring it out and like making your own way. And like, you know, like I'm going to just, uh, write a book about this and I'm going to illustrate it and I'm going to get it into this person's hands and that. So I'm curious about your, your beginnings in all this of what was the initial drive for, you know, your, I mean, you just have a natural talent for it, I guess. I don't know, but you seem to just go get it. And I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to, if I don't, if it's, if if there's not someone hiring, I'm going to make my own thing and make it happen. So how do you do that, Molly? How how do I do that? Um, (laughs) uh, I think I, I think it comes from being kind of a bad student and um, an ill-disciplined young person. So, okay. So first off, the reason I think that it was easier for me to be an artist than for many other people was that my mom is an illustrator. And so I never thought of art as something that people couldn't make a living at. Art was Mm -hmm. like a totally like just legitimate craft that my mom like made, you know, a lower middle class living at and she put food on the table. And that is a, a, just a normal way that adults, you know, make a living, right? Just like if I had a dad that was a carpenter, I might, you know, think of carpentry as a good way to make a living. Or dying Um, on a cross. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Or dying on a cross. (laughs) Sorry. Well, you know, you build it and then you use it, right? <laughs> yeah, you build it and then you use it. All right. <laughs> so, but but then, um, you know, I uh, was always just really bad at normal jobs. I just sucked at them. I mean, to give you an idea of like what a spoiled little like horrible person I was, I remember I was 14 and I had this job at a, a candy store and I was like 
taken boxes out of boxes and put it, taking the rubber band off the inner box and putting it back in. And, and I like lasted one afternoon at this shit. I was like, this is a waste of human life. Life is finite and death is infinite. And I yeah. am wasting my finite life taking rubber bands off of fucking boxes in a dark yeah. room. What the hell is bullshit. Uh, so <laughs> I was always like, how do I, um, you know, how do I make money? Right. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to be back in that dark room putting rubber bands on boxes. I want to do something else. And so I am um, was, you know, like, I think probably like you and like most of us, like I was like a pretty good artist when I was a kid. I'm not saying I was a genius or anything, but I was, you know, it was pretty good. I was like the weirdo art kid in, in, in my class. I can see that. At, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I would always just like draw people and very often I would draw like the popular kids. So they would, you know, deign to speak to me or not yeah. beat me up. And so <clears throat> I was like, okay, you know, my drawings, they have value. I can um, exchange this for money. And so I would just like, at first I would hang up like flyers in bodegas to draw people's pets, or I'd hang up like flyers at the comic book store to like draw people's D&D characters. Or like hmm. I would go on Craigslist. This is, you know, a long time ago. It's like eight, se 17 years ago. And I would find stuff through there. And like, I wasn't, I wasn't good, you know, at the start. Like I actually kind of suck. Like sometimes I look at my old shit and I'm like, what the fuck? Like, how did I publish that? This is like an oil painting and it had like my hair in it. How did I fucking not notice that my fucking hair is stuck in this oil painting? It's like, you know, shame on me. But, but I was just, I think I had this sort of persistence and sort of maybe desperate persistence that comes from just really being like, I have to make it yeah. with this because I, I just can't do anything else. And, and I had dropped out of, I dropped out of, um, the Fashion Institute of Technology. So I didn't have, have a degree or anything. I was like, what am I, what am I gonna fucking do? And I guess I, first I just, I mean, I got better because I, I drew all the time. And then like every single time there was anything in the world that like had a space where either there was drawing or there you know, could be drawing. I was like, well, that could be my drawing. And I just, you know, kept trying and trying and trying. And like, I mean, I had, I failed so much early on and a lot of it deserved it. Like, I don't think I would have hired me, you know, at that age either. <laughs> um, but I, uh, you know, I just, I just tried and I tried and I tried. And because I, I always loved history and I always loved like reading, you know, biographies of like old school artists like Aubrey Beardsley. Um, I didn't just think of like, what are people doing these days? I, I would be like, what did Aubrey Beardsley do? You know, um, what did someone like Toulouse Lautrec do? Like, oh, Toulouse Lautrec did like posters, you know, for, for dancing girls and for musicians and nightclubs. Like I could, I could do shit for nightclubs, you know, even, even if no one else is using illustration in nightclubs, Toulouse Lautrec did it. Why not me? Right. Yeah. And um, I guess early on, I just like, I don't, I don't believe in big breaks. I didn't have a big break, but the thing that changed my life was that there was this fancy fucking nightclub in New York called The Box. And The Box, it um, was the sort of place that like the worst people in the world, like all the hedge fund douchebags and like the, you know, Gulf monarch, monarch, you know, princelings and stuff would go there and they would blow through $10,000 a night, like just drinking vodka and champagne, you know, wasting money. And on stage, they had these amazing performers, you know, acrobats, burlesque dancers, fire eaters, every every manner of like crazy shit. And I, I just thought the box was the coolest place in the world. And one of my friends was performing there. And so I would go and I would like very ostentatiously with my sketch pad, sit there and as I'm sure you know, like when you go somewhere and you draw, people start looking at you and they start talking yeah. to you, it's pretty unusual. And so I, I kind of talked my way into, um, First, just having my own little seat to sit there, you know, that was enough. And then starting to get hired by the club to do stuff like uh, theatrical backdrops. Mm -hmm. And because they also loved that sort of like decadent, you know, Parisian 19th century vision, I could pitch myself as that. And I could be like, I could be your to lose the track. And yeah. yeah, that was what that was what changed everything for me, that that gig. And um, then I guess the second thing that changed everything was that um, Occupy Wall Street happened, you know, right, like basically outside my window and down the block a bit. Yeah. And um, I started, uh, you know, documenting it with my sketch pad. And, and that was also something where I always read about, you know, these cool artists documenting histories that happened. And I thought, you know, I, I can do that. And um, so, yeah, I, is, that, is, that, is that a methodology of how you find uh, how to get your way into the things you <laughs> wanted to do? I don't know. No, it's great, though, because you're, you, you, what I love is that you're the kind of person that just, you it's like you follow through with what you believe in. Um, you don't just, you know, say a bunch of shit and then don't go follow through with it. You know, like yeah. you're, you're def I mean, like last time 
I was, I was staying with you. Let's see. Yeah. Last time I stayed at your guys' place, I think was just before everything happened. Um, uh, I think it was like in late February or something like that. And I remember Fred and I went out and had a great night. We went to see, to see some comedy and, um, and then we came back and we, we, we drank a little bit. A night. little bit. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then, um, I remember like maybe only a couple, we, I only slept for a couple hours. All of a sudden the sun was coming up and, and there was like some kind of protest happening like a block away. And you're like, Hey Jace, we're going to a protest. You want to come with? And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> You're like, you're like, I'm so hungover. What, what, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> like, I have a protest going on right now in my head, okay? And it's not going well. Um, but it was, I thought it was cool though that um, I, that was that you guys were just like, you know, you, you don't just like post your Instagram posts, like check out how cool I went to, because I know plenty of those people. No, but you oh, actually, suck. yeah, you actually follow through with this stuff. But what, what's cool about it is um, even your, with your writing and stuff, and I'd like to get into that is, um, you, um, you, you know, you go to these things and you, you protest and everything else, but then you write about it and then you illustrate it. And it's, there is, it's so, um, I love that you brought the, the Toulouse Lautrec thing because there is, I can totally see that with like, even of, of course your style and everything, but there's that, um, that, you know, that burlesque ish type thing happening, but there's like, one of the things I loved about, um, Toulouse Lautrec um, is that he was living within all of the, you know, he wasn't like just one of those people that was like out there, just like, I like to draw these. No, he lived there. He did it. He was a part of it. And you can see that because you're literally capturing um, what's actually happening within and around you. And it's, it's, that's what is exciting about the art that you make is that it's like, you can look at it and you're like, she's not just like, you know, just like drawing comics or something. It's like, no, this is some real shit. And like you, you've, uh, if you don't mind, I know I'm kind of all over the place here, but um, I find it really interesting too, because then you started working with Vice and different people like, journal, you know, writing for, for, um, oops, sorry. My phone's getting weird shaking. Sorry about that. But you started working for, um, you know, different people writing and everything. And then you start getting sent, uh, you know, to the Middle East and different places. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I don't know what you can share, what you can't share, but I always find it fascinating that you've done those kind of things as well. I mean, it's just, it's like, it's, it, it's funny. Cause Fred will be like, I'll, I'll start texting him randomly. Hey, how's it going, bro? Good. good. Yeah. How's Molly doing? What's up? Oh, she's like, you know, in the middle East somewhere riding on a camel, um, drawing <laughs> with pen and ink. And I'm just like, oh, okay, <laughs> of course she is, you know, <laughs> So I'm um, like my first, so I wanted to be a writer when I was in high school and I actually I wrote a novel it is so bad but I slogged through all 200 miserable talentless pages of writing and I finished it and I actually think that there's something to that you know having yeah. finished something as a writer no matter how bad because most people who want to be writers can't even finish a bad thing right mm. um and so I had always wanted to do that um but I just I just didn't know how to get into it I never had the opportunity and then um so for the one year anniversary of Occupy, I got, um, I got arrested by this cop. He just like dragged me into the street and then arrested me for blocking traffic. And um, I was really mad about it, even though to be honest now, after everything that's gone down, I feel like it was a pretty innocuous arrest. You know, it was just like 11 hours in a cell for no reason. But at the time I was very mad. And so I, I wrote, I got the chance to write an, an illustrate an article about, about these um, arbitrary arrests that they were doing at protests, including, you know, my own experience. And, um, I had like a, I had an agent and he placed it in CNN and, and they tried to make all these changes. They were really terrible, but I got something out. I got something, you know, published. Mm. And then after that, I, I knew some people who were editors advice and I just got asked to do kind of more personal essays. And I, I mean, I got paid really little. It was like a hundred dollars an essay. I would kill myself on these. And, but, you know, I was learning how, learning how to do it, learning how to write something interesting and engaging. And then what happened was that I had a friend and this friend was a journalist and he got permission to go to Guantanamo Bay. And when he told me that, I was like, I didn't know people could go to Guantanamo Bay. I, especially not, you know, independent mm -hmm. freelance journalists, maybe like New York Times, but I, I just didn't know this was something people could do. And so I, I asked him if he could tell me how you apply with the military. And um, 
I, uh, I was able to get like security clearance to go to Guantanamo Bay and to cover the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed trials. Uh, he's the, the guy who um, blew up the Trade Center. And, or not trials, these are their pre-trial hearings for this like bullshit form of like fake law that they made for Gitmo, mm -hmm. but bas basically the endless Khalid Sheikh Mohammed hearings at, at Guantanamo Bay. And um, when I went there, um, I had already done, done like tons of research talking to um, the lawyers of the like mostly innocent guys that are there and, or that were there and learning all about the prison. And I went there and I mean, it was just the most surreal, fucked up, like twisted evil place I had been that, thus far in my life. But also um, it was a place that was under a really, really strict military censorship. So uh, they would, they called it like OPSEC and they'd be like, okay, you can't take some, you can't take a photo that has a door in it and it can't have anyone's face and it can't have a camera and it can't have this and that and that. And before you knew it, the only photo you could take was one pointed directly at the floor, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. there's, um, but I could, I could draw, you know, I could, I could draw and I could not hide, but very often bring attention to those things that were censored. Like, for instance, if I wasn't allowed to draw mm. faces, I would draw these like blank, like not smiley faces because they weren't smiling, but sort of like blank smiley face-esque icon masks, you know, mm. to show how interchangeable the, um, the uh, soldiers were. And I wrote like a big piece on uh, Gitmo and I illustrated it. And I, I think I was like the third... I think the third artist who ever went there, maybe the fourth. And um, I think when people saw what art could do in a highly, highly censored situation like that, it um, it opened the door for, for other things for me. And I mean, being a freelance journalist and not just being an artist, but just being a writer, a photographer, whatever is really hard. It's really, it's really dangerous, honestly. Like not, not what I did, I'm a fucking coward compared to so many people, but like what a lot of my friends do, um, you know, people, people die in it all the time. Um, I know um, a lot of like really brilliant freelance journalists who are like now 50 and they're completely broke because there's no uh, stability, you know, to the field. So it's like, it's really, it's really hard, but there was a, a moment um, in like, like a few years after, you know, the Arab Spring where, all of these freelance journalists were um, going to the Middle East to cover, you know, the, the revolutions that were happening, and also um, the the waves of refugees. And I I just started going and and covering it. And um, I guess I was kind of good at finding strange things, maybe that other people didn't find. I mean, one of the things that I'm proudest of is when I was in, I was in Dubai in 2014 and I was covering uh, like the, lab the labor stuff, which is basically modern indentured servitude there. Mm. And I had a friend tell me that Donald Trump was going to do a, a press conference for this golf course that he was licensing his name to in Dubai with some sheikh and with Ivanka. And so I scanned my way in and since it's Dubai and since it's like a police state, right? Everyone is just kissing this guy at Trump's ass. Everyone is just like, oh, Mr. Trump, do you like Dubai? Because Dubai stands for luxury and so do you, you know, all this bullshit. And I asked him why he was paying his guys, hundred, his construction guys, 150 bucks a month if he was all about luxury. Yeah. And the whole, the whole fucking room went silent and they screamed at me. It was like, no one could fucking believe it. It was like, I fucking ruptured something, you know? I wish I had gotten a video, but I, I just wasn't, I wasn't Who thinking. I was actually- is this woman? <laughs> he didn't, no, no, he didn't even <laughs> say anything. I just got yelled at by underlings. Right. His like mouth, you know, it's like a little anus and the anus mouth shrunk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no words came out, no shit. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know. It was like that, 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 that ability to, be in the same room with this powerful motherfucking bastard. And I don't think I was like holding him to account. I don't think I was, you know, shaking the halls of power, but I at least ruined his 15 minutes. And what else do I get to ruin <laughs> that sort of person's 15 minutes? Very, very few times, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the that's, that's, that's way I would describe it. <laughs> yeah, man, that's crazy. Anything, um, so I know um, you, you've told me before like a few different stories and but when you're over there covering some of this stuff, was there any time where you were uh, like freaked out or you had to be like extra, extra cautious? Oh, or, all the time. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah no, pretty much all the time. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you mean like, cause I remember you, you told me too, that um, you had to wear, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? The Chabad or 
or oh, it's, yeah, like a, that, a scarf over my hair. Yeah, I can't remember exactly, like, but you had to kind of blend in everything. But were you carrying sketch pads and stuff with you along that, or was it just mostly journaling at that time, or like how were you, um, you know, kind of witnessing things or experiencing things and then putting it all down and and uh, that sort of a so, thing. So a lot of times, like I would, I would just work with local journalists. I mean, one of sort of the dirty secrets about um, the foreign correspondent market is that there's lots of local journalists that. Um, Sometimes because their English isn't that good, but honestly, sometimes because of just like racism or like discrimination against people because of passports, they basically work at a job called being a fixer, which means that they will take like um, a New York Times correspondent around and be like, you know, here's this thing that's happening. Here's this thing that's happening. And then the know nothing New York Times correspondent, um, you know, writes everything down. Um, fortunately, like as my Arabic got better, um, and just sort of, as I like got to know more, I didn't need to have fixers as much, but I, I definitely had fixers at the start too. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was all different sorts of things. I think probably the, the coolest thing I got, not, not coolest. That's a horrible way to put it. I mean, it was a horrific thing, but the thing that I'm maybe pr proud of, does that make sense? Like of being able, being able to figure out how to do was, um, there was a guy that I was in contact with who was um, stuck in these, uh, they're called hotspots. They're, um, they're Greek refugee camps, but they're not meant for people to live in. These are like fucking shit. This is like a whole family living in one camp in tent meant for one person, yeah. you know, and like it just, just, just being caged like a fucking animal. And so he was stuck in this hotspot. He was a young uh, guy, aspiring photojournalist with his like pregnant wife and everything sucks. And he, he's on Facebook through his phone because everyone, he, I mean, that's the thing, like everything, no matter how shit people's situations are at this moment, like everyone has smartphones in the world. And so people can very often <laughs> connect even if they're literally living in hell. And so I, I got in touch with him and um, I decided to go to this island and I wanted to go into this um this can't this hot spot and um then like thank god for him he got finally him and his wife got uh, transferred out to you know and put in an apartment uh because because she was pregnant and it just was not like a place for a pregnant lady to be in you know yeah. but um i was already in the island and i was like fuck how am i gonna get into this camp i don't know anyone and um the camp on Samos is really in the it was really in the mountains um it was pretty far from the little town there and I am uh, super scared of dogs. I am a big, big uh, <laughs> coward when even little ones, but especially like, you know, big ones. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, I'm like, I find on Google Maps uh, where the camp is. And I like start hiking into the mountains. Of course, I have impractical shoes. I think there were heels involved. It was very embarrassing, you know. Oh and um, and uh, then there's these like big, scary dogs, you know, the, you know, the kind of farmers have, right? Yeah. And I'm like, fuck, I can't go down. You know, I came all the way here. Like I have a vice story. I can't. So I'm like, so I'm like texting Fred and I'm like, what do I, what do I do with these, these dogs? They're barking at me. And I think, I think it was Fred who told me, he's like, oh, you take a stick and you hold it over your head, you know? And I just remember like taking oh this stick <laughs> and um, the, so, you know, so I could get, and the dogs, they left me alone. And I was like, I, I felt so brave, you know, I'm like, I've overcome this. And then I, I went to, um, creepy. I, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, other people probably would not have been scared. Maybe, pro probably someone will go back there and they'll say those are all fucking toy poodles, Molly, you know, but I was, I was scared. And uh, then I saw the, you know, camp, which was really, it was vile. Uh, it was like all surrounded with barbed wire and fence and stuff. But hmm. I saw the people that people had cut a hole in the fence and they were, you know, leaving it and, you know, going in and out. And so I, um, I went and I saw like a lady, you know, in a hijab who looked, you know, she's dressed like a Syrian lady. And I told her in my, my heavily accented, not far from perfect Arabic that I was a journalist. And, and she immediately starts talking about how she was a teacher in Aleppo and, you know, how her house was bombed and how, like, you know, there's, like, water from the toilets coming onto, like, the floor where they're sleeping and just, like, how, you know, how it's just, just shit there. And she's like, come, you know, I'll show you. And she, you know, took me and she showed me around and um, she kind of watched out for me. So, you know, no one messed with me when I was there. And I, mm. I met, like, really interesting people. I met this, like, this dude, he's like a Palestinian dude from Syria. And he had this like California accent because he was like just obsessed with like, you know, basically with like hip hop and, and Grand Theft Auto and like just American pop culture. Wow. And he just like wanted to soup up cars. He's in, he's in Holland now, like for, like souping up cars. Like he has, he has a garage and he like can- oh, That's awesome. Cool shit. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> I met 
I met I met him. I met this other Iraqi guy who was like an, who was a, a poet. And at first, he told me that I didn't believe him, but then he like synced up music like classical Arabic music and like started declaiming like classical Arabic, like you know, like poetry, like meter and rhyme and everything, you know. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, just like these like cool, cool, talented hmm. people, you know. And um, yeah, I got to I got to know people and and stay in touch with them and you know see like just really smart resilient people who were in this like, shit situation through through no fault of their own but were managing to uh live and make lives for themselves anyway you know in defiance of that all um but i was uh, i was personally proud that i did not let the dogs scare me away from you know i gotta say though, i i think that it is very brave of you it takes courage i mean you're you know, a lot of us Americans, we hear about things. Um, if we are any kind of person that has any kind of heart at all, we care about things and we, you know, we want, we want to be a part of something, but it's, I find it very um, courageous to, to go there and to like, like dive into this and just put yourself out there. And I don't care if it was a fucking little poodle or <laughs> that's scary. That's like, that can be scary. <laughs> Those things, you know, eh, you don't know. Um, but but still, the fact that you're you're going there, and I mean, just to see it firsthand and to hear from people there and get a different perspective. I mean, I had a completely different, um, you know, idea of what I thought the Middle East was like or Iraq, Iran, um, when you know, gosh, maybe even like 10 years or so ago. Um, and since then, I have met a lot of people. A lot of I've made some friends. And just hearing their perspective of things is just so amazing how much different and how, how, how much different it is and how much more alike they are to us than we've been led to believe in a lot of, you know, in a lot of ways. So I find it, you know, at least for someone like you, you actually have taken the step and gone and, and, and explored these things. And it's just, it's a pretty awesome experience. I mean, um, if it wasn't for people like you, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be, you know, most of us would just... <laughs> What do you have for Chipotle's today? You know, <laughs> so I mean, it's pretty. I think it's pretty amazing. And as far as your art um, and everything, it's just I, I, it all enriches it. You know, like it's just it makes it more like when um, I guess we could talk a little bit about your book as well. That um, when did that come out? It was like a couple years ago now. Yeah, um, you mean, well, the, drawing blood or brothers yeah. of yeah, drawing blood. Yeah, um, that's the most recent one, right? Brothers of the Guns, the most recent. Oh, the guns. Well, yeah. can, do you mind just sharing a little bit about that? Because I, I, I think it's so amazing, just like the, you know, the mix of your writing with the artwork and how I, I find it like so much more impactful. For some reason, also just the fact that you are the one that did the art. It's not like, you know, someone writes a book and then they hire an illustrator. It's there's it's something more uh, powerful about it. I think. I don't know. It makes because for me, as someone that was that wants to read it, I can look at the, the images and be like, oh, my gosh, she did us. You know, <laughs> it's it's way cooler that way, I think. Thank, thank you. So like yeah, Drawing Blood was my, my first one. And that one, you know, cause I'll, I'll talk about that one because it's the one yeah. that I just I did. I did all of it, you know, um, and Drawing Blood was my, my memoir of, you know, becoming an artist in New York about all the fucked up things you do in your 20s. But, you know, when yeah. I was like a burlesque dancer and a naked model or whatever, that's how I supported myself before I, uh, <laughs> before I was able to make a living as an artist. And it is a combination of, you know, just a, a prose book with um, lots and lots of drawings based on uh, my memories of those times. And yeah. I don't know, like, there's nothing, there's nothing like that, like going back and trying to remember, like, what did that crazy what did that like crazy ex-friend of mine look like with her like punk purple hair and those like hard ice blue <laughs> eyes or like what did ruby valentine look like in that club when she was dancing with those fans you know um and i guess i was lucky in that a lot of it was set in new york and so i was able to go to all these places that i had lived or that i had experienced stuff in and i was able to you know look at them again and even if time had changed them i could um you know, remember, remember a lot of it, like, yeah. like the Chelsea Hotel, right? It's still, it's still there. It's, it's all fucked and gutted, but, but, and mostly, mostly empty. Um, only a few people live there now, but it's still there, right? Like you can, that, that history is still, it's still there. And yeah, I felt, I felt really lucky to, to get to both write and draw it. I mean, I don't, I think it, it's very hard. Um, and I have, you know, often illustrated other people's memories too, but it's very, 
hard to illustrate other people's memories with the authenticity and the specificness that you yeah. can, you know, bring to your own because you know it, right? It's your life. Yeah. Well, that's what's so cool about it. That's what's, that's, I don't know. That's amazing. Again, just bring it up, bring up Toulouse Lautrec again. Like if he had a book like that, like where he, oh you know, yeah, it's like, it's just, uh, that, I, that's what's really cool about it. I just love that. Um, yeah. It gives me warm butterflies, um, so to speak. But you um, always have your sketch pad. Like every time I hang with you and Fred, like, like, I mean, I sketch a lot, but you guys, you fucking do tight sketches. Look like, like finished illustrations. I remember <laughs> when I'm like, hanging out at a bar, there'll be some dude that looks weird and both, and you two will be there, you know, with, <laughs> and you'll do these like perfect yeah. things. No, that's fun though, man. I, I love doing that kind of stuff. Um, I can't Did wait you ever to get in go- trouble? Did you ever get in yeah. trouble for doing drawings of people and they saw it? Yeah. Well, let me think here. One time, well, there's, there's a couple. So one time I was on the train on the sub on the, well, not really the subway. We call it the L train here. And um, I, I would kind of be secretive, you know, but I still had my sketch pad and I would just like look at people and kind of just sketch and everything. And there was this guy, he just kept looking at me. He just kept looking at me like, and I, and I, and I got to the point where I'd look up and he's just staring at me. So I'm like, oh, shit. And I, I really wanted to draw him. So I kind of started um, looking at someone else and started sketching. And then he kind of started walking, like kind of, can, you know, trying to get closer to me. And he was like, and then he was just like standing by the rail, holding it, looking over me. And he's like, I knew it, motherfucker. <laughs> he like started yelling at me. He's like, cause he could see that I clearly was drawing him. And he, he, he wasn't happy, but he didn't really do anything, but it was, it was kind of scary at first just because he, he yelled, you know, like, you know, it was a little bit like, okay, dude, it was just, it's just doodling here. It's not a big deal. But most of the time people think that it's cool. You know, yeah. um, one, one time when my, my oldest daughter now, um, when she was really little, we were sitting at a Starbucks or something like that. And um, I was waiting for her sister to get out of a little class that she had, like an art class. So I was doing little watercolors and my daughter was doing watercolors. And there was this woman that was just sitting there. She had this great side profile. So I just started sketching her and uh, she had a really long nose <laughs> and um, I, I really pushed it really far. And I was just having really, you know, a lot of fun. My daughter just innocently comes walking behind and she looks at it and she goes, Oh, you're drawing that lady with the really big nose. Like she says it so loud. Oh, did the lady know? Did the lady realize? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) She saw and she's like, look, she didn't look, you know, very happy about it. Oh, poor. She's um, probably like hiding her nose now. Yeah, it's like, it's like, I, ah, Isabel. (laughs) And uh, my friend Grigor and I, we both got kicked out of a Borders once. Um, we were at the, in the cafe section and we were just sketching people together where we got coffee and we're just sitting there just drawing and showing each other. It was fun. It's, it's almost like two comics, like kind of telling jokes to each other or something. Like we're just sitting there yeah. like drawing and, um, he would draw this guy and I'm like, Oh shit, I want to draw that guy. <laughs> and then, um, people started noticing. And then eventually the, the, one of the people that worked there came and they're like, um, are you drawing people here? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like you have to leave. What? Like you were drawing in a strip club? Is that what they were acting like? But at the borders? They said they said that this is this is making people very uncomfortable. I'm like, it's like we weren't like being loud or anything, you know? Oh my it's god! Like, oh my god! Well, people don't but, like to be looked at. It's like when you're being seen at this moment when you thought that you were like all anonymous. I think yeah. it disconcerts people. Yeah, I mean, the the best thing that I've ever experienced was when I was in Ireland. Um, I was in Galway, and. I went into the, this is the first time I ever drank anything in my life. I I didn't have my first beer till I was 30 and I'm in this bar. I walk in and it's just all like, you know, and they're just like, you know, clanking their glasses and there's big black glasses with the foam. I'm like, what is that? That looks great. And I was like, I want one of those. And um, I had no idea that like a Guinness is basically like a meal in a cup. Yeah, and yeah. I thought, you know, a man just drinks down a beer. That's what a man <laughs> does. And so I'm looking around and I, they give me my Guinness. It's like this big. And I'm just like, gong, gong, gong. and I drink like half of it in one. And it, I was like, damn, that was not, it was not good. Um, it just was like really harsh. And then I went back. I actually got tipsy, so tipsy oh. from that one glass. But I, obviously got in a really fun mood and uh, I got on my sketch pad and I just started sketching people 
um, in the bar. And it was so much fun because people started really flocking around. And what ended up happening was a bunch of Americans came into the bar and I had my like, you know, my newsy hat on that I wear a lot of times. And I think they thought I was like a local Irish guy or something. <laughs> and they, the, someone gave me like, um, like 20, uh, 20 euro or whatever it was. Um, hey, can you draw my friend right there? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> so I started drawing and I, that night I made like, like close to a hundred euro. I just, awesome. I just kept drawing. And, and I think they all thought it was like this local uh, guy because at the very end of it, this guy came up to me and said, oh man, your drawings are awesome. This is so much fun. Thank you so much. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. And, I repeat, and he's like, what, you're American? And, ah! I was like, it's like, and, and, and no like Irish caricature <laughs> artists came and like shift you for busting their spot like that? <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm from Chicago. And they're like, they're like, oh man, we thought you were Irish. But um, it was awesome because I just was like, I'm just making money. You know, this is so cool. Just sitting in this bar. Um, yeah. But no, I think most, most of the time it's positive you know but i'm not going i'm not going to like serious places and where scary things like little poodles are charging <laughs> you and stuff and <laughs> i mean usually if i'm in a place like that though like either i have like kind of two modes one is like i don't know if it was a, like a checkpoint or something i'd be very very sneaky mm -hmm. but usually um i mean i take out my sketchbook and i just ask people right and most people most people like to be drawn where, wherever wherever um, they are in the world. Um, when I was when I was in Gaza, I I would just like talk to people and be like, "Can I draw you? Can I draw your kids? Can I draw your family?" And people, I don't know, they thought it was kind of they thought it was kind of cool, you know. Um, especially if people are in a situation where there's a lot of um, forced inactivity, which is what a refugee camp is, you know, and um, it's like just something to, you know, something to break up the time. And yeah. I've always, I've always tried to get my drawings back to people. Like, um, I, when I was in, um, when I was in Abu Dhabi drawing those, drawing those workers, I, I had this, this amazing, brilliant dude that I knew. He was like a Pakistani dude and he was working, um, like just sort of serving tea at the construction companies. And he was so smart and he hated those places, the, the companies so much because they were so fucking racist. They could not imagine that like a Pakistani guy had a thought in his brain. Right. <laughs> and so this, this Pakistani guy was basically pretending he was just like a dumb kid who served tea. Well, at the same time, he was tipping off every single major newspaper about all the labor abuses there, mm -hmm. uh, like New York Times, Amnesty, everything. Um, he just, he was like so smart and he knew so many languages and he just had such a, this like sort of like fuck you swagger about him. And um, when I drew these guys that he introduced me to, I um, sent him like high res stuff and he like printed them out on his boss's printer when he wasn't looking and he made like little art prints and gave them to all of these fucking dudes in these like you know oh like staying staying in these um you know in these camps that workers live at there and i was like this is so cool this is better than like any fucking museum or, or gallery show or whatever this is like you know the real the real people having having my work that's awesome that's really cool um hey uh I want to show you some fan art in just a bit because there's some. Oh God, is this going to be the part where like I I'm gonna like yeah. see this and I'm gonna be like the COVID mask is never coming off because you've so traumatized me. Um, but I wanted to just one. I just wanted to say one more thing about your just your work just from my experience. Um, I feel lucky to have known you and Fred for as many years as we have, and um, just like every time I come to New York, it's my favorite thing is to see you guys and and uh, you guys have been so gracious letting me stay with you, um, and crash with you and everything, but. I've gotten to be there while you're in the middle of like, you've had film crews coming in where you're working on some crazy project where there's all this pressure and you're being filmed. And then, and then there's other times where um, you're working on some serious projects and, and I got to just sit there and watch you. And, and it's really, it's, I love it because it's such a, a different approach or different way of working than how I work and just like experiencing and seeing your style and your technique was so cool. And I, one thing I always loved about your work is it's almost like this, it's, first of all, it's very organic. And it's like, it's almost, it's like, I mean, you can like hear the scratching of the pen. It's just like, and it's almost like aggressive. And like, you're getting in every once in a while, a little bit of ink splats somewhere and it, and it's fine. You don't care. And then you get out no, the I'm watercolor careful. and it's just, it's just, everything's just kind of like alive and moving. And, um, and it's just, a, it's really interesting to watch it because it, it, it is like a living organism while you're working on it. It's like, it's pretty, it's pretty fun to, to watch that. So, I don't know 
I'm sure you have, because like I said, there's been at least two times I've been there where you had someone filming and documenting something. So if there's uh, anywhere where people can watch that, um, that'd be awesome if you can let people know, but um, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And then it was really cool too. I think one time I was there, you were working on this giant oil painting. Um, gosh, I think it was like seven feet tall or something like that huge one. It had like, it's like the red one with like the bubbles and different things. Yeah. 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 And it was so cool just watching. Cause like you, you really get into it. Like it's, n- it's not like, Blah, blah, blah. That's a little painting. It's like, you know, you're just like, fucking, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fucking splatter <laughs> shit on it. And, yeah. and then I'll, then I'll be like, I hate this. I hate this. And then Fred will tell me why it's good. This is why it's always good yeah. to be with an artist. Cause like <laughs> when you're, you know, crying on the floor, cause you're, you think your painting looks like shit. Your, your artist boyfriend can be like, this is why it looks like shit and you can fix it. <laughs> um, That's pretty yeah, awesome. I mean, I, I guess like I, I draw like that. I don't know out of a profound maybe greediness and impatience. I, I think a lot of the best things about anyone's style comes from their, their weaknesses as a person yeah, and their I think so. as an artist, yeah, rather than their strengths. And so I think, yeah, that sort of like visceralness, it comes because I'm like, I'm impatient. Like, I'm like, I want to do it. I want to get the image down, you know? And um, if something <laughs> splatters, then so be it. No, it's it's awesome. It's, it, 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 I think it it's just really great because again, like it is so completely different than, than how I do things. But like what I remember just watching and being like, wow, this is like inspiring. Like it's just because, you know, I have a tendency sometimes with, you know, I, I, I plan things out. I, I mean, I have to work it's, I'm very similar to how Fred does things. You know, you, you, you have to have a sketch approved uh, and, you know, you kind of look for some reference and put a sketch together and draw it and paint it and all that kind of stuff. But it's still very, like, I know exactly what I'm doing um, and I'm kind of, kind of neat about it in a way. Um, even when I do my oils, I'm very like, like, this is where the blue goes. This is where the yellow goes. You know, I'm very, it's all neat. And, um, and this is funny because my, my wife is a painter as well. And it's funny because she's the complete opposite. Like I do pre sketches before I put something on a canvas and I make sure I get it on, I, I get it just right. Put it on the canvas. She just goes right into the canvas and starts drawing. And, and it, even if it screws up, she just wipes it away, starts painting again. And she's got this palette that is so insanely disastrously messy. She's got paint all over her hair, all over her everywhere. And like, it's just funny how different it is, but she ends up having really awesome results. And, you know, it's, I just love that process of how did you get there? And it's just interesting to see how different people do it. You know, it's, it's cool. Also, one of the things that's kind of cool about caricature is caricature is in many ways very scientific, I feel like, because like someone actually, I forget where I read it, but someone smart said that caricature is actually more recognizable than photographs. It's like more the person than the person is. And to do that, like you have to be like quite analytical about like, you know, what, how their features go together and like what's bigger and what's smaller. I mean, to do something that both is distortion of reality, but also is more real than real really is being like a scientist. And so I get why like you guys are so meticulous with that. I think that makes a lot of sense. No, yeah, I, I, I often tell people that same thing that I think a really, really good, solid character, because there's a lot of shit caricatures out there, but really, really good ones look more like the person or can look more like the person because it not only looks like them, but it feels like them. And yes, the yes, exactly. Capturing the feeling. And that's, I think, what's really cool about that kind of, you know, that kind of work. That's what we try to do, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I try to do it with re- realistic portrait work as well, you know, like trying – and and I think the reason that works is because of my my obsession with the caricature stuff, because even in my portrait stuff, I kind of push things just a little here and there and yeah, yeah. Um, for a little character. But I think, you know, I think we all do in a way, <laughs> you know what I mean? Any artist is is like, I mean, that's what makes it unique and awesome is every artist has their own thumbprint, you know, you know, it's yeah. not going to be a carbon copy or hopefully not. Yeah, it's like we're not like just taking a photo with with all of the sort of randomness and often like the unesthetic crap that is in a photo and yeah. and just copying it. It's like we're we're taking like reality and melding it and you know. Yeah, that's what, that's what, that's what I love about that. I love and again that's what, again what I was saying about your work is that organicness to it. Like I I try to do that with my work as much as possible even if I'm, if I'm working digitally try to have like some kind of organicness where I you know even if I set some of my brushes digitally to a way where they they're harder to use or they leave a weird mark or something that is actually something awesome because it, it it's kind of separating that digital 
thing a little bit and your own voice, your own, your own way of how do you handle this problem? Because, you know, and instead of everything being perfect and smooth, like you can do digitally, yeah. you know, um, I think that's, that's, uh, something that you can even do traditionally, you know, like, like I, I love, um, gosh, who was it? Uh, I can't remember. I think it's, I think it's John Lennon maybe said something about, you know, like he can't play a tuba, but if you give him a tuba, he'll make some art out of it. <laughs> like yeah. he'll, he'll something like that. And I always think about like, you know, like what, what, you know, one thing I love about being an artist is that idea of give me a piece of cardboard. And this is another, go back to Toulouse again. It's kind of funny how the, he, Toulouse has been brought up so much, but um, years ago I was at, a, at a, I think it was here in Chicago. There was this really awesome Toulouse Lautrec show. And I went around it and I never, that's the first time I heard of him and saw his work. And this was like 2003 or four or something. And the show was just awesome. And at the very end of the show, and a lot of his, his pieces were on cardboard, which I thought right away was, oh, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And right at the very end, there was like this painting that he did of Van Gogh on cardboard. And then there was a painting right next to it that Van Gogh did of him on cardboard. And then the date is the same date. They were sitting together in a cafe painting each Staring other. Staring at each other, man. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I got chills. And I was like, that is the most real thing I've ever seen in a museum. It was so cool. And I felt so connected to the, to both of them. Um, and and I, I remember thinking like that, that, that saying that John Lennon said, and I wish I had the exact same quote, but like, I remember thinking how awesome is it that we could take a piece of cardboard and some colorful mud yes, and, yes. and, and just create some kind of image that's impactful and powerful and, and that people could remember and see like hundreds of years later. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty magical thing. I think, you know, it's, it's oh my God, it's, exciting. It's like, it's like, okay. I, I know you hate all religious metaphors, but um, this is, you know, you know, like no, the fucking, yeah, the fuck it, the priest, they take their hands and they wave it over the cracker and they're like, this is the body of Christ. But that's actually what we're doing. We're taking our fucking hands, we're taking the colored mud and the, and the cardboard and we're fucking moving our hands. And then we're like, we made art now. We made something yeah. now. We made something that's like the fucking, that has like the spark of like the divine or genius or ideas or whatever. Like, like we actually like are doing that transmogrification with our, with our own hands, you know? Yeah. No, it is. It's pretty awesome. I think that's what keeps me doing it is that, um, that almost like you don't I don't the one thing I think that's amazing about being an artist and it doesn't matter if it's writing um, acting comedy painting sculpting whatever no matter how good we are or how, how good people say we are whatever there's never ever a, a stopping point oh, to no. what you can learn or how much more you can learn or, or how much more you could do or accomplish or play with. I mean, and that's the thing that's interesting about it. And when, like, it's, it's amazing to me how many times I've heard artists say like, oh, I'm just bored or I, you know, I'm, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I'm not really into this anymore. I mean, I've heard a few different artists that have been doing it for years. The style hasn't ever changed or evolved. And it's like, dude, that's, that's in, that's you. <laughs> that's yeah. like, you got to, you gotta wake up, man. You gotta, there's so much more that can be done. You know, it's, I don't know. That's what's exciting about it. Oh, it's one of my babies. Oh. <laughs> I have a, a daycare upstairs. Um, but yeah, that's, what's exciting about it too. And I, and I think it's cool. Like someone like you who like dips your toes into like a lot of different mediums um, and you're a creative person. And so it's like, you know, you, you can basically, if, if you're, I, I kind of think that you're, you're the kind of, kind of person that if you, if it's something that you're interested in, you can make art out of it. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, it's like the world is like, art is how we interface with the world, right? Like, like our fucking, our sketch pads and our pencils and our paints, like that's, that's like those, those, that's like our, 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 I don't know, our antennas, our cat's whiskers. That's our, like how yeah, we yeah, deal yeah. with it, right? And um I don't know. The world is just so big. It's so big. It has so many wonderful, terrible, fucked up, complicated things in it. And like, I mean, if I could use my art and I'm sure you'd feel the same, I'm sure all the artists like listening feel the same. Like we just want to use our art to like absorb that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, as much as we can anyways, you know, it's uh, it's like also just, 
I think for a lot of us, especially throughout this last year, very therapeutic, <laughs> you know, it's been everything. It's been everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, um, this, this is the time. Uh, for okay, you what to, horrors! To face the I, truth. I, I swear, yeah, it's like I'm. I, I have this fucking. <laughs> do I have my, like a mask? And I could put my foot on. <laughs> Here you go. I'm gonna share some of these with you. Let me know if you see that. Um. Oh, that's cute. That's not. That's not. That's not. That's not. That's not evil. That's not evil. That's a. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to like. But, um. You know. Uh, cover my face for life now thank you thank you um <laughs> thank you hutch <laughs> yeah this is uh paul hutchinson um hey and that's the famous i mean i don't know if, if paul knows this but your famous bathroom <laughs> yes, wallpaper. Everyone... <laughs> everyone takes selfies in front of your bathroom did you, take, did you take a selfie in front of it i did and i i, I texted to you like last <laughs> there it was like when i i went to new york with my daughters i took them to new york and you weren't there but excuse me we stopped by and said hi to fred oh that's and, right uh, that's right I took a selfie for you. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Um, this one oh, that's is fucking, um, yeah, that's fucking brutal. The mask of the mask is the mask is going to become a lifelong thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank my... you. Uh, Giacomo Davina. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, my chin needs surgery. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> this is by Jacques Lamonia. <laughs> he loves it when you say that. Can, can you can you say it? Say Jacques Lamonia. Jacques Le... What the fuck? Jacques, Jacques Lamonia. I, I can't, man. Lamonia. I, <laughs> Lamonia. <laughs> I um, used to like think I could fucking speak French when I was in high school, and it's all clearly died. Jacques, you've um, thank yeah. you for that that beautiful chin that you've given me. <laughs> Ooh la la, c'est cher. <laughs> Très joli. Here's a, here's a fun one for you. This is by Tony Lewis. <laughs> okay, I, I see the chin is a, the chin is a theme. The chin is a theme. <laughs> hey, don't worry, don't worry. There's redemption. There is redemption. <laughs> Uh, this is by Aww, that's, that's nice. Thank Zyla. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Maybe I'll show my face again. <laughs> Here you go. This is <laughs> that's um, nice. by Graziano Di Carlo. <laughs> I know the painting he, he used as reference for that. Thank you, Graziano. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, it's funny. There's, I think, a few that were very inspired to paint you as Mona Lisa, I think. So um, <laughs> <laughs> this one is by Yano Tabik. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. it's, it's actually, uh, despite, despite being a brutal and brutally accurate caricature of my forehead, the watercolor is gorgeous on that. Yeah. It's really, that's really done. I will overcome my ego enough to say <laughs> that's a very fine drawing. <laughs> <laughs> he's got some skills, that Yano yeah. Tabik guy. Yeah. yeah. He's, a fa he's a famous artist, right? Yeah, you know, he's pretty famous. Yeah. No, he's awesome. I really love yeah, his work it's, a lot. It's fucking beautiful. Yeah. His watercolor. He actually used to, like, years ago, early 2000s. I think it was when I first saw, uh, became aware of his work, but he used to do these um, marker drawings that were ridiculous. Like just with the markers, I couldn't believe how awesome they were. Uh, no, it's yeah, really he's, he's like, it's just the way he makes the marks and the hair and everything. There's kind of like, I don't know, like the squiggly way that the darker marks are. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. It's nice. Here we go. Here's another. <laughs> this is by <laughs> Mr. Ponce. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Yeah, everyone's kind of doing that jaw chin thing there, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> the in the background looks like menacing, like yeah, like maybe that's what I don't know. Maybe that's how I got my chin. I laid waste to the landscape and turned it all into like chin implant substance. You're Molly Lisa of the dark arts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know this is by Mark Young, and cool. you know it's funny. I think he told me, if I remember correctly, that he. You reminded him a little of uh, Alanis Morissette or something. So he was trying to like do something with Alanis Morissette. I don't know, like a mix or something. I'm not sure. Interesting. I could say, yeah, because of the long dark hair. Yeah, something. I got one hand in my pocket or something like that, right? <laughs> Have you ever listened to Alanis Morissette? So, yeah, there was, there was, she did the famous like breakup song, right? Um, you ought to know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, that's is. cute. <laughs> this is uh, by Juan Gastelum. <laughs> I like that. I like my little fetish, um, my little fetish latex um, tube dress, and my and be and riding on a riding on a brush like a witch. That is that's adorable. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Good one, Juan. <laughs> uh, this is by Dustin Clark. Cool, I like that one. Very sinister, very Morticia. It's good. 
it is a little 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 evil looking and, uh, but uh, but i'm i'm evil so that works oh, that, that's lovely yeah this one's really nice this is oh this is that painting i was talking about before the one that you're standing in front of uh this is by christine Verati. It's, it's really beautiful she did like a really really good job getting all the like detail on the hair and stuff and um all of the the folds and textures it's really it's really well done yeah it's pretty nice um she's she's actually been hand, uh submitting a few of these now and the one thing I really love, you, she's she's a real painter. Like I, I love seeing how she, uh, I can tell like she's doing like an underpainting. Like a you know she saw like the red kind of painting behind, so she like makes that as a base, and kind of pulls everything out of it. And she's she seems to do that quite a bit. And it's kind of it's kind of cool. It's got like a nice yeah. organic painting feel to it. So also it's it really super cool. glows. Like look at that red bounce light on my on my um it's my my right arm. Um anyway it's like. Yeah, it's like has like fine ass color theory in it. Yeah, no, it's awesome. She's she's pretty cool. She's pretty cool from school. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm such a dork. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, uh, for submitting those. It's always fun. Appreciate that. And um, uh, real quick before we we end this bad boy, um, <laughs> and is there anything that you're working on new that you want to share or talk about or anything coming up or? So all of my stuff that I'm working on is like pretty, pretty long term and won't be out, won't be out in a while. Um, so basically, like if I'm going to plug stuff, you could buy uh, my books are Brothers of the Gun, a memoir of the Syrian war, which I did with journalist Marwan Hisham and uh, Drawing Blood, which is my memoir. And you could find um, either of those. Um, also, uh, Amazon fucking sucks. Pre order them through an indie bookstore. <laughs> Yeah, and you okay, can awesome. and you can you can order them all through through indie bookstores or through bookshop if there isn't like an indie store around you that um that you can order stuff online at. That's awesome. Cool. You hear that? Buy the books. And I'm yeah, telling buy you, my they're, books. they're awesome. They're really awesome. You definitely need to buy them. And uh, Molly, thank you so much for uh, for joining me for this. This is so cool. Um, I've been wanting to get you on this for a while and talk with you. Um, I miss you guys. I miss. I can't wait to come back to New York and hang out and. Uh, Hopefully we'll be able to do that sometime soon. We'll see. But um, anyways, thanks. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. We miss you too. And yeah, you always got a place on our floor and thanks for having <laughs> me. It's a pleasure. <laughs> I always have a place on your floor. I love sleep on your, on your floor. It's very nice. <laughs> All right. Bye, 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 bye Jason. It's All right. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. You want answers? 